book of Philippians chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I have a very important announcement. Can you say atmosphere shift? No, I want you to say it with power. Say atmosphere shift. In just a few weeks, we are going to be going in to a weekend of prayer, revival, of atmosphere shift. And this atmosphere shift is going to be with a man of God that God is using there on the East Coast, Matthew Thompson, there from Jubilee, Boston. And this man of God, God is using him in a very powerful way. He's a friend of our pastors. He's a friend of this house. And in a few weeks, he is going to be joining us. And God has poured out an anointing upon his life to teach the church, to teach the people how to pray and get a hold of God. I don't know about you, but the only thing that has gotten me this far has been prayer. Come on, somebody. Are the women still on fire to get a hold of God and pray? How about the men of God? Do, do the men of God know how to pray and get a hold of God? And if there's ever a time or a season in the church, it is now. The church now needs to pray more than ever before. The church now needs to learn to get a hold of God more than ever before. So October the 26th and the 27th, Pastor Matthew will be with us that whole entire week. And Saturday we're going to have a, 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 an atmosphere shift seminar. Sunday morning he's going to be with us. And then Sunday night it is going to be a time of worship and prayer. Come on somebody, give the Lord some praise. So. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. If you've got something on your calendar, you just need to cancel it right now. You need to cancel it. And you need to be a part. But here's something that I'm anticipating. That we as a church, Victory Outreach, would begin to set the atmosphere for a breakthrough and for a powerful move of God. I don't know about you, but I need a move of God upon my life. Anybody need a move of God upon your life? Come on, somebody. Are you satisfied where you're at? I need a move of God upon my life. I need the atmosphere to shift in my heart. I need the atmosphere to shift in my home. I need the atmosphere to shift in my ministry. So I believe that what we need to do as a church is begin to prepare and cultivate a powerful move of God. So... I just wanted to make mention of that because we have been talking. Our pastors, our leadership, we have been talking. And we are feeling and sensing that God wants to do something very powerful in our church. How many of you believe that with us here this morning? Come on, do you believe that? Amen. Praise the Lord. I know you got your Bibles in your hands, so we're going to get into the word here. So I just wanted to make mention of that announcement. And you'll be hearing more about it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, are you feeling blessed? Get a hold of your Bibles. You got them there, Philippians chapter 1. And I'm going to give you the title before I read the verse because I'm going to just give you the title the way the Lord gave it to me. And for some of you, it may not make sense, but hopefully it will make sense to you as we begin to get through this message. The title of this message is Prayer in Prison. Prayer in Prison. In Philippians chapter 1, starting there in verses 12, this was Paul. Paul was in prison and he began to share a letter. And even though he was going through what he was experiencing, what you're going to hear about, he still was able to pray and get a hold of God. So let's read a few verses here in chapter 1. It says, but I, I want you to know, brethren, I like the way he kicks it off. I want you to know, brethren, that the things which had happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And that most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains... That's powerful. That regardless of our change, that there are some people that will get breakthrough. 
regardless of your circumstance, regardless how much you've been tied down or how the enemy has tried to get over on you, when you begin to push through, there will be people that will be encouraged by your chains and much more bold to speak the word without fear. Heavenly Father, we thank you one more time for everything that you're doing within our church. So, Lord, I just ask that you would anoint my life. Father, would you use this word that you've given me to touch, challenge, and impact the people here at Victory Outreach San Diego. Just, Lord, I just ask that you would just use me as your vessel. Lord, would you just use me as your vessel to be an encouragement to your people. We thank you now. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Before you're seated, look to your neighbor and ask him, how's your prison life? Amen. Prayer in prison. I want you to do an exercise with me. And I want everybody to do it. I, I, I kind of, I even want our tech people, our musicians... Do this exercise with me for just a moment. So I want you to focus. I want you to focus. Get settled. Get settled. Get settled. Get settled. Close your eyes. Just, just close your eyes. I'm not going to pray. I just want you to think about something. Just close your eyes. And I want you to just kind of clear every thought for just a moment. Close your eyes for a second. And here's what I want you to ask yourself is, what is my purpose? Think about it for just a moment. What is my purpose? Take a moment. Just think about it for just a second. What is my purpose? For some people, your mind may be racing right now to try to figure out your purpose. Some of you may be zooming through different areas of your life and you may say, this is my purpose. Think about it for just a moment. Amen. Open your eyes. If your purpose went all over the place, and if it was not to please God, then you may be off this morning. See, because many times we look at our purpose and we think it's to do all these different things to do all these different things and and there's nothing wrong with a lot of the things that we need to do as men and women of God but I as I began to get a hold of God and read his scriptures and everything that I've learned from the last 30 years of serving the Lord when I get off track from pleasing God, nothing never works out. And that's something that I believe that churches in America, Christians today, we need to get back to the main purpose. And that main purpose is to please God. I'll say it again. That main purpose is to please God. And that's why... So many people can struggle today and go through so many things because we think our purpose is on all these other things when our main purpose should be on pleasing God because when you're pleasing God and your life is right before God, then everything else begins to work out then all the desires of your heart will be granted to you. All these things will begin to begin to flow out of your life. And I wanted to do that exercise because when I did it, it was powerful in my life. Because, again, my mind went all over the place. I began to think about all these things, and I began to think about all these things. And the Lord rebuked me in my office right there at home. It says, son, you've got it all wrong. You've got it all wrong. I, I, I didn't save you so you could do all these things. I didn't save you so you could learn all these skills. I didn't save you so that you can, you know, have all these titles. I saved you so that you would worship me and that you would give me praise and that you would give me glory. Please me. 
That's why you've gotten to where you are today. It's because you've learned how to please me. So I believe that when we get back to our main purpose of why we've given our lives to God, we will see things work out in a very tremendous way. So I wanted to just to lay that out for you before we begin to get into the message. Our purpose should only be to please God. Paul was in prison, not, uh, Paul was a prisoner not of Rome, but of Jesus Christ. And his chains were in Christ. And he did not look to his situation as an opposition, but he looked to him as an opportunity. And many times when we go through things, we look at the trials and the situations that we go through as opposition. But they are simply opportunities to get a hold of God. They are simply opportunities to get on our face before God and let him fill us up. See, Paul was practicing Romans 8.28. And many of you know it. And what does it say? And we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. Things will always work together for those who love God. And when you love God, and 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 you love God, you love God in the morning, you love God in the afternoon, you love God in the nighttime, you love God at your workplace, you love God, things will begin to work out within your life. See, do we think first of Christ when circumstances and difficulties hit our life? Or let me ask you this question. How about when you hit that spiritual prison? Is Christ the first person you look at? And and I think every one of us are guilty of this. I'm guilty of it. That all of a sudden I begin to look at the situation instead of looking at the Savior. Instead of looking at the one that could see me through the problem and the circumstances. And I understand that in this flesh that we sometimes struggle with putting this flesh under control. Come on, somebody. Don't look at me like that. Some of your flesh right now is just roaring. Because we have not gotten in to the spirit. And many times the, 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 the flesh will roar within our lives because we're not in the spirit. The Bible talks about it is that the heart is deceitful and wicked and no man knows it. And so that's why we've got to put it, what what did the scripture say? We must put this flesh under subjection daily, daily. And what was the main ingredient for Paul to walk in his purpose while he was going through hell? What was the main ingredient? If you begin to look at the life of Paul and you begin to study his life, the things that he went through, his powerful conversion and all the different experiences that he had. He, he, he went through hell. He went through trials. He went through persecution. But the main ingredient that got him through everything that he went through was prayer. Say prayer. Come on, say it like you do it. That's why some of you couldn't say it because usually you can't say what you're not good at. When you're good at something, you're confident in what you're talking about. Now, I know that there is a time where we've got to begin to develop this prayer life. And if there's ever a time to develop it, the time is now. The church now needs to pray, needs to pray, needs to pray, and needs to pray. And for Victory Outreach, we need to pray. And I'll tell you why. Because we work with some difficult people. Don't look at me like that. Some of y'all are difficult. So we got to pray. Come on, somebody. We don't have all the answers to your problem. We don't have all the answers to the situations that you will experience. But one thing I've learned is that when you pray and God begins to get a hold of your life and he begins to pour wisdom into your life, you will see breakthrough. You will experience breakthrough. You will experience miracles within your life. This human mind cannot begin to explain or even handle the problems that we begin to experience. 
But the power of Almighty God is able to give us what we need, and it comes through prayer. Come on, clap for the Lord here this morning. So even though Paul was in prison, bound in chains, he was still able to focus on his purpose because of prayer. Paul was able to preach the gospel. He was encouraging the churches from prison. Come on, somebody. If you've ever been incarcerated, the only reason you wrote a letter was to try to get some commissary. You were trying to get something. Hey, would you come and visit me? Can you put $10 on my books? Can you send me that girl's information or send me that guy's information? Come on, somebody. But look at the mentality of Paul. He was encouraging people. It didn't matter how much he was in change. It didn't matter his situation or his circumstance. He was still encouraging people. He was encouraging churches, even though he was chained and locked up behind bars. Look at one of Paul's letters there in 2 Corinthians 1.8. It says, we think you ought to know this. Again, he, he comes at a way of encouragement. Dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the providence of Asia. We are crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, watch this, we stop relying on ourselves and, re and learn to rely on God who raised the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Even though he was in prison again, he was still encouraging. But I like what he said, that we've learned to stop relying on ourselves. And we learn to rely upon God. I don't know about you, but God has seen me through some things. He's seen me through some situations and circumstances. And if he's seen me through then, he will see me through now, and he'll see me through the future. And you know why people struggle today, Christians struggle today? Because they're too busy relying upon themselves. They're too busy relying upon their gift, their talent to get them through. I got news for you, church. Your gift and your talent is not going to get you through the hardest trial of your life. The only thing that is going to get you through the trial of your life is going to be prayer. Get in the hold of God. And Paul demonstrated that here as we read about his life. And see, this type of mentality is only produced in prayer. It's only produced in prayer. And I've had experiences like that. You know, I've, I've, tried, I've tried to fabricate a mentality like that based upon what I know and based upon what I think. But I got news for you. It never worked out. It only got me so far. But when I've learned to get a hold of God and pray and let him fill me up, let him speak into my life and let him change some things within my life. My mentality begins to shift. My mentality begins to change. And I begin to walk at a different level. But it only happens through prayer. Now, what will this type of mentality do for you? Well, I think before we could see what it does, we need to understand the word prison. Because in the original language... One of the meanings means craftsmen. See, many times you could look at prison as chains and stocks, and it means that. But in the original language, if you look at it, one of the words means craftsmen. In other words, prison will shape you. And those of you that have been incarcerated, prison has physically shaped you. But when you're in a spiritual prison... And you find yourself in a spiritual slump, it shouldn't just bound you, but it should shape you. See, we all have an opportunity. Look at it as an opposition or an opportunity. And, and we should allow this prison to begin to shape us and not hold us down. See, the chains or prison experience we face shouldn't hold us down, but it should actually lift us up. 
And see, this is where the mentality begins to come into play. See, because we all have a choice to think of our situations, whether it's to think negative or positive. And the problem is, is that this flesh will always try to hold us down. This flesh will always try to hold us down from seeing breakthrough, from seeing miracles, and to see great things come out of it. But when you have a mentality shift because of prayer, all of a sudden you start thanking God for the trial. You start having joy in the trial because you know that God's going to get the glory because you know he's going to see you through the trial. And that only happens in prayer. That only happens through prayer. Prison should point us to prayer. Prison should point us to prayer. And not anywhere else. But many times we've got it wrong. So let me, let me just break this down for you and then we're going we're gonna to close. See, when we go through things, we need to remember our purpose and not get stuck in the trial or the chains of the prison. Because our purpose should be to please God. Remember. Our purpose should be to please God. And what is our, pas- our, our posture as a Christian? It should be prayer. And not getting a hold of God. You may say, what? What do you mean getting a hold of God? No, no, no. Not getting a hold of God, but letting God get a hold of us. See, because many times when we go to prayer, we say, I'm going to get a hold of God. That's the problem of today. We always want to get a hold of God because when we get a hold of God, we always want to ask him for something. But I believe our posture should change that when we come to prayer, we should want God to get a hold of us. Because when God gets a hold of you, he changes things within your life. You ain't asking for something. He's changing you. He's changing circumstances. That's when the atmosphere begins to shift within your life. When God gets a hold of you. Oh, and that's something that I'm being convicted about because many times, many, many times I've come to the altar and I've come to the throne of God wanting to get a hold of God. And God would begin to show me, I'm tired of you trying to come to me and tell me how to work out your situation. You need to come to the altar and let me get a hold of you so I will tell you how I'm going to work out this situation. Because the way he works it out is way more powerful than what you could do. You ought to clap for the Lord right there. You ought to clap for the Lord right there because God wants to get a hold of you. Stop trying to get a hold of God and let God get a hold of you. Let him get a hold of you. Because when he gets a hold of you, things change. Circumstances change. Atmosphere change. Things happen. And that's what Paul did. He let God get a hold of him while he was in prison. Now what did prayer do for Paul? First thing is this. Prayer motivated Paul. And prayer should motivate us. See, Paul was motivated in prison. He wrote letters of encouragement even when he was bound. Because he knew the joy of the Lord was a strength. And that only comes through prayer. That only comes through prayer. And when you are in prayer, there is a motivation in you to please God, to do God's will. And you got to understand something. If the enemy could take your motivation, then he could take control of your purpose. And it's easy to lose motivation in the day and age we live in. The moment you leave this auditorium here today, there is something that's going to try to snatch your motivation from from allowing God to get a hold of your life. There is something that's going to snatch your motivation from prayer. There is something that's going to try to get you away from praying. And one of the biggest enemies, one of the biggest things that the enemy will use to try to get your motivation away from prayer is being too busy to pray. I know some of you are too busy. Some of you got a lot of things to do. Some of you got a whole list and agenda of things to do. But I got news for you. I'm ready to expose the devil here this morning. 
if you are too busy to pray. I'll say it again. If you are too busy to pray, then you will not last. You will not make it. There are people today in this world that are not making it because they were too busy to pray. And because they were too busy, they lost their motivation. And they started pleasing everybody else instead of pleasing God. Instead of pleasing God. Let me move on. See, if the enemy could take your motivation, then he could control your purpose. This is why, this is where commitment kicks in. You pray whether you feel like it or not. You pray whether you feel like it or not. Have you ever experienced that? Like, you know you needed to pray. You even got up, right? And you're in there and you're ready. And, and, and it's just like, man, I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't. It was just hard. Let me just put it that way. Anybody ever experienced that? 90% of you are lying. <laughs> right? But this is where commitment comes in. You pray anyway. You pray anyway. And when you pray anyway, God will get a hold of your life. But prayer will motivate you. The second thing is that prayer keeps your priorities straight. Prayer kept Paul focused. Prayer kept Paul focused. Paul's main concern was to preach the gospel. Paul's priority was evident through the palace guard. As you begin the research, he was even chained to a guard. And his priorities did not get away. And I can imagine him. I, I, I kind of think like I can imagine him. I, could, I can imagine him being chained to the prison guard and just praying and getting a hold of God because he knew where his source was coming from. He knew how God would use him in a powerful way. And he had a responsibility to encourage the people of God. He had a responsibility to encourage the churches. And he did not get away from his priorities. See, when you're praying and God is getting a hold of your life and he's speaking into your life, you're not going to let any other priority begin to get in the way of your personal prayer of, of, of talking to God. And you know, here's the challenge today. Is that many of us, our priorities are off. Our priorities are off. I wonder if there are people that are not here today because their priorities are off. See how quiet that got? Because you all know some people that should be in the house of God this morning because their priorities are off. Come on, go ahead and praise the Lord. Come on, somebody. Go ahead and praise the Lord like you got your priorities straight. Come on, do you got your priorities straight here this morning? See, when you pray, your priorities are straight. And when you pray and your priorities are straight, you begin to please God. I like what Proverbs 16, verse 7 says. It says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. If your enemies are roaring, then I would ask you the question, are you praying? Because when you're pleasing God, when you're praying, you're pleasing God. And when you're pleasing God, your enemies, come on somebody, I'll say it again, your enemies, your enemies ain't rising up against you. But you know why the enemy rises up against you is probably because you're pricking at your enemy. Because you're in the flesh. And because there are things that are stirring in your heart. And so what are you doing? You're beginning to point at your enemies and you're beginning to prick at them. And you're beginning to throw things. At them. See, that's what the flesh does. But when you're in the spirit, you don't worry about your enemies because you know that God is the one that is controlling your enemies. So if your haters are rising up around you, come on somebody. If, you, if, if you're paying attention to your haters and your haters are there and your enemies are being stirred up around you, then I'm, I, I, I would question to say is what are you doing about it? Are you throwing rocks at them? Oh, you shouldn't have talked to me like that. Oh, you shouldn't have said that. And who do they think they are? Brother, let me just tell you something right now. That's the flesh. Because when you know that God is the one that is in control of every situation and you've given that situation to God, you don't worry about your enemies. Your enemies will be pleased with you. Come on, somebody. See, when we please God, 
things begin to work out. Catch that. When you please God, things begin to work out. Maybe not the way you want them to be worked out, but he works it out. And see, when, you're, when you are spiritual, you begin to accept the way God works it out. See, many times we don't like to accept the way God works it out. Because it's not the way you wanted it to work out. But when you're pleasing God and you're walking in the spirit, you will receive and you will uh, uh, go ahead and, uh, and accept the way God begins to work it out. And many times the way God begins to work things out within our lives, we don't like it. Because usually through his word, not my word, but usually through his word, most of the time through his word, let me just say every time through his word, when you begin to see things change within your life, it, that's exactly what it is. It's change. His word begins to come at our lives so that you and I are changed the way we think, change the way we do things, change the way we walk, and change everything about how we handle things. But many times, we don't like change. But when you're in the spirit, you will accept the way God Handles things within your life. Come on and give the Lord some praise here this morning. I'm almost done. A question that I believe we need to ask ourselves. Can you say God is pleased with your priorities of him? Think about it. Can you honestly sit there today and say, God I'm pleasing you with my priorities. I think every one of us can take an examination upon our hearts and say, you know what? I don't know if I'm pleasing God the way he wants me to. That's a question I think we need to ask ourselves. See, prayer will keep your priorities straight. And there are some Christians today in America that need to straighten out their priorities. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to finish 2019 strong. How about you? Come on, are you ready to finish 2019 strong? And if we're going to finish 2019 strong, then we got to get our priorities straight. we got to start making some changes. we got to start preparing our hearts. That's why I'm preparing my heart for October 26th for an atmosphere shift. How many of you ready to shift the atmosphere within your life? Come on, I ask you again. How many of you ready to shift the atmosphere within your life? Look at if you want to stay the same, then don't even worry about it. Keep doing the things you're doing. Keep living in sin. Keep living in the flesh. But if you're ready for the atmosphere to shift within your life, within your home, within your marriage, within your ministry, then you've got to make some changes and get your priorities straight. I'm just letting the Holy Ghost use me right now you got to begin to make some changes within your life. And the Lord began to speak to me. I'm telling you, we've been talking, we've been talking, we have been talking. And it hasn't just been for you, but it's probably been for us. It's probably been for me. Things got to change. Things got to shift within my life. Some things got to shift within your life. See, and prayer will keep your priorities straight. Number three, prayer will give you power to live in the present. I don't know about you, but I need power. Come on, anybody need any power? That was weak. Anybody need some power here? Or do you got all the power you need? That's what I'm saying. See, you got you to get your priorities straight because some of you walk in a power that's got no effect on anything or anybody or any situation within your life. When there's power in your life from heaven, things change. You tell things to change. You shift things to change because of the anointing that is in your life. That's why nothing happens good in your life because you have no power in your life. You've got to get that power. That comes from heaven. And the only way that power comes is through prayer. So if you ever wonder why nothing changes within your life, it's because you ain't got no power. Because when there's power in your life, things change. Things change. 
Praise the Lord. Will give you power to live in the presence. Paul's life was in danger, but his prayer life gave him power to overcome. What did it give him power to overcome? It gave him power to overcome fear, loneliness, and even a sense of abandonment. And he was even chained to the prison guard. He had power to go through the trials that he went through. Look at Paul's prayer as he preached it here in Philippians 1:21. A couple verses after, it says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. I believe that's probably all of our prayers. But look at verse 24. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. In other words, he needed to remain in the flesh because of the power that was flowing through his life so that it would help the people, so that it would help the churches. It would help the people that would come to him. So what are we, why, why do we need that power? Because the power that comes from your life from heaven will begin to overflow and it begins to overflow into your family it begins to overflow into your marriage it begins to overflow into your church it begins to overflow into the people that walk into the doors of the church the people need your power the people need you to be filled with prayer the city needs you to be filled with an anointing that comes from heaven We can't tear down this wall until you're filled with power. This wall will not come down. We cannot expand until you get out of the flesh and walk in power. You've got to be able to walk in power. Because if we're going to receive a harvest, if we're going to receive families, if we're going to receive people, they're not coming in here for a show, but they're coming in here to receive breakthrough and miracles within their lives. And it cannot be done with people that walk in the flesh or walk unspirit-filled. But we need a spirit Filled church of people that will be spirit filled, people that will rely on the power of Almighty God to fill their lives. <laughs> Philippians 1:21, what it said, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. We need to be able to be a people that will walk in the spirit. See, prayer will give you the power you need in the present storms we face. I don't know about you, but I don't want to die in the storm. I don't want to die in the prison. I need power that comes through prayer. Anybody here believe me, but agree with me here today? Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a good praise. Come on, give him a strong praise. I want them to come to the keyboard. You know why it's so important for you to draw power? From your prayer, because people need to see it coming out of our lives. They are watching you. Do people see you as flaky? Or do they see you as faithful? Because every one of us are a billboard for God. How do people see us? How do people see you? Do they see you walking flaky? Or do they see you walking faithful? Faithful to prayer and faithful to the things of God. Faithful to church. This is not just a thing to, to get people to do works. I believe that works is just an evident of what's happening inside your heart. It's when you're loving God and you're and and and, and God's getting a hold of you and you're letting God work on you, you're gonna want to do something for God. You're gonna want to impact the kingdom. You're gonna want to tell somebody about Jesus. You're gonna want to see somebody saved. You're gonna want to be involved. You're gonna want to be a part. You're gonna you're gonna want to do things. 
But you know when people stop doing things and when people stop preaching and people stop telling uh, uh, people about the goodness of God, it's not because you don't have what you need. You didn't get the budget you need. What happened is that something turned in your heart. Because remember, remember when you first got saved, you had no clue about a budget. And you had no clue about what you needed to do in order to build the ministry. What did you do? All you knew is that God changed and transformed your life. You had a Damascus experience. God saved you. He rescued you. And all you needed to do and all you felt to do was just tell somebody about Jesus because of the experience you had. And then what did you begin to do? You begin to fuel that through prayer. And because of that, things begin to break out within your life. There are people today that are stuck, not because of what's happening around them, but because of what's not happening in them. So you can't blame things around you. You've got to blame what's happening in you. Don't matter how mean that brother is. Don't matter how mean that sister is. It don't matter the situation, the circumstance. It don't matter what kind of money you got in your bank account. It doesn't matter what's happening around you. What matters is what's happening in you. Come on, somebody. What's happening in you? You were actually more happier when you had no money. You were actually more happier, happier when you had to take the bus to church. Now you got three cars and you ain't even happy. You remember you got up early. You ironed your clothes the night before. And you said, you know what? I can't miss the bus because I got to get in the presence of God. God saved me. He changed me. He turned my life around. And I just got to get to the house of God to pray. Stand with me all over this place. The simplicity. The simplicity. It doesn't matter what's happening around us. What matters is what's happening in us. Because when things begin to happen inside of us, then, then we can change the things that are around us. Because of the power that flows through our lives. Because of the anointing that flows through our lives. God did not raise up victory outreach, an inner city ministry that will go into the highways and the hedges that will go into the worst cities of the world to not go in with power and anointing. We need power and we need anointing, but that only comes through prayer. Letting God get a hold of our lives. And when things begin to change in us, then we can start moving and change things around us. I've asked them to prepare this song so they would remind us where it all first began. Do you remember that? simplicity when you gave your life to God. All you wanted to do was pray. All you wanted to do was read His Word. All you wanted to do was please Him. And I believe if there's ever a time in America and the churches today, that is to please God. Please God. I'll say it again. Please God. Please God. Stop trying to please your leader. Stop trying to please the situation. Stop trying